Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and I'm con continuing to discuss a very interesting and I think very potentially um, an excellent idea from C Stephen Salter. He's with the University of Edinburgh. He's an emeritus professor in the engineering and design department. And for decades, he's been looking at ways to cool the planet using cloud brightening, uh, more specifically, marine cloud brightening. So for all water droplets to grow, you know, when you have water vapor uh, that rises upward through convective uplift, the water vapor condenses into droplets. Now, in order for the water vapor to condense into droplets, it needs, there needs to be cloud condensation nuclei. There need to be particles, small particles, up in the atmosphere that the water can adhere to and form the droplets. Now, these droplets are randomly distributed in size in the atmosphere, not quite randomly. There's a bunch of, uh, there's a peak of small ones, the Aitken peak. There's a, there's a peak, an accumulation peak of larger ones, and then there's extremely large ones. Now, when the particles are, so there's a distribution of particle sizes naturally. There's, from breaking waves, you get seawater then evaporating in the drops, and then the salt crystals then going up, or you get dimethyl sulfide particles that are produced from phytoplankton, and these particles can go up in the air and act as cloud condensation nuclei. But there's a huge distribution of sizes of these particles. So what we want to do is we want to brighten the clouds. We want to brighten them so they're much higher reflectivity, so they reflect a lot more of the sunlight coming down back up into space to prevent the surface of the Earth from cooling. So that's the key idea. Now also, the, when you think about the generation of particles, there's lots of sources on the land to generate particles, including, for example, bl uh, blowing dust from deserts. Okay, so over the land, the number density of particles, the number of particles per cubic centimeters um, is actually quite high. It can be, you know, a hundred, you know, a thousand, two thousand, five thousand. Okay, a, there's a large number of particles um, over land, but over the ocean, there's much fewer particles. If you're talking about the air from Antarctica coming off Antarctica, for example, there might only be, you know, one to ten particles per cubic centimeter. You know, in most of the ocean. You might have 10, 15, 20, you know, certainly under 100 uh, particles for cloud condensation nuclei. And there's a distribution of sizes. So what we want to do with these boats powered by Flettner rotors with spray nozzles, taking seawater, bring it to high pressure, pushing it through tail engineered nozzles so that we get the proper size that we want. And that's about 800 nanometer water droplets coming out of these nozzles. When the seawater evaporates, we end up with the salt crystal being about uh, 0.200 nanometers or 0.2 micron in size. And that's a perfect size so that when the water vapor that rises up and condenses onto these salt crystals that we've created, it creates water droplets in the clouds that are very, very tiny and fairly smoothly distributed and are highly reflective. So we can figure out the power needed to run these pumps and ships. And, um, you know, they're, they're basically, it's from the wind over the ocean that is, that is powering them. Um, and then they, their movement with the hydrofoils going up and down can generate the electricity to run the propulsion of the ship and to run the pumps. And these things will be autonomously controlled and they'll move into different locations depending on the season, okay, uh, to, do, to do their particular jobs, okay, which is to cool the planet or cool specific regions of the planet. Okay, so that's the whole 
idea um, behind this. So let's look at the details from a uh, PowerPoint presentation that, that Stephen um, just sent me um, a few days ago. Okay, so marine cloud brightening, you know, as an emergency break on climate disaster. So a couple of interesting slides first. Um, this is an old advertisement, Life Magazine, 1962. Humble is a small town in Texas. Each day, Humble supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. Okay, they're actually advertising this. This company turned into Exxon, but they actually advertised that they produced enough energy in the town to melt 7 million tons of glacier. I mean, you wouldn't want to promote that now, would you? 7 million tons a day of loss is 80 tons a second. The world ice loss rate now is 79,000 tons a second. It's about 1,000 times more um, than, than this number, okay? So, you know, we're losing the Arctic ice. This is, this is glacial ice. Um, of course, if you look at the temperature, the warming mean surface temperature anomalies on the Earth, you know, the poles, we, we know that the poles, the Arctic in particular, is warming like crazy, and the Arctic sea ice is in a death spiral. So this is September the black, the, the, uh, where there's most sea ice is um, the peak in, in March, March and April. Uh, but each, uh, each month, you know, the average sea ice over the month is reducing and reducing. And this is spiraling quickly to, to zero. And then it will drag down the next closest months, August and October. And then it will drag down July and November and so on. And eventually we'll lose sea ice year round. There's a recent paper uh, that just came out that Peter Carter was ta telling me about that, um, that actually talks about that um, being, becoming a reality. Okay, if you look at an area like the Laptev Sea, um, then you can see that, you know, the, the drop off, the melt in that area, the ice is going faster. Okay, it's melting out and being gone most of the summer. Okay, so we're losing, you know, I could show you all kinds of data on the Arctic. Um, you know, this is, a, this is glaciers on the surface of Greenland. As we're getting the surface ablating and melting away, it's exposing all of the dark ash and all the contaminants and dirt. So the albedo is dropping significantly and that leads to more and more melt and more and more water runoff. This is an image here of Greenland, the surface of Greenland, all these meltwater ponds. And of course, they are all dark and they greatly uh, reduce the albedo, reduce the reflectivity of the Greenland surface and accelerate the warming. And of course, we know that the CO2 levels are rapidly rising. The methane levels are rapidly rising in spite of all of the climate conferences. Okay, these are different conferences in different years and, you know, no effect. I mean, the accelerate the the co2 level is accelerating you know methane's coming up more and more in the arctic and methane is a very very strong greenhouse gas this is the um this is the methane uh global warming potential if you like so depending on the lifetime of methane if it's 9 or 12 or 15 years you have these different curves so when methane is released, it has a global warming potential of at least 200 times more than CO2 in the first year. The average is 200, as high as 250, 150. Again, that, it depends on what you take as the half-life. And, and there's a shortage of hydroxyl radicals up in the high Arctic. Okay, so that would tend to make the lifetime uh, a bit longer. Okay, so, you know, the methane would stick around for longer and cause more warming there, you know, uh, in the uh, in the northern summers. Okay, and the methane clathrates are starting to thaw, and methane is being released, and it's trapped under the ice, and you can put holes in the ice, and you can actually set it on fire. Okay, this is Sean Twomey, who's the gentleman who first did the measurements of clouds to try to determine the 
reflectivity of clouds as a function of the diameter or radius of the water droplets. And he found that the smaller and smaller the droplets, the higher the reflectivity. So this is a perfect demonstration of that. Okay, so here we have four millimeter glass balls and uh, you can see the color here and try to match it. This is a scale. This is like, uh, this is be, would be 10% reflectivity, 20%, 30, 40. This is the albedo, if you like, going up here. Okay, so you can match this color to, what it, to, to one of some, somewhere in here. If you have very, very small glass balls, so if you have 40 micron glass balls, okay, um, a micron is a millionth of a meter. So if you have 40 much, much smaller glass balls, they're much brighter. They're, they're a much whiter color. Their albedo is much, much higher. This albedo might be about 70%, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70%. This albedo is closer to 90 or above. Okay, so you, but just by making smaller and smaller water droplets in the clouds, you can get much higher reflectivity. So we're not making clouds. We're just brightening the clouds that are formed. So this is uh, John Lathan, and uh, he, in Nature 1990, he wrote an article, it was published in, in the journal Nature in 19, 1990, that we could cool the earth by spraying submicron drops of seawater into the marine boundary layer. Now, there's opponents to this idea, of course. So this gentleman here, Pierre Humbert, Raymond Pierre Humbert, he says the idea of fixing the climate by hacking the Earth's reflection of sunlight is wildly, utterly, howlingly, barking mad. Okay, so this is what he says. Uh, but, you know, it's funny because I would maybe use this description to describe <laughs> his appear. <laughs> what, you know, I mean, he just looks like some, you know, mad, mad scientist himself. So when he's saying that, you know, hacking, you know, by changing the reflectivity of sunlight on the earth is being a crazy idea. You know, maybe we need to look into it and not take his word for it. I think we think he's wrong. Okay, so what you can do is you can look at the size of the sodium chloride um, spheres, little microspheres or little cubes, because often they form in a crystalline cube. And what we, uh, what this shows is what basically what happens is, is you need to, uh, you know, if you have very, very tiny salt crystals, then you, you need a higher relative humidity before they start to grow, before water starts to condense on them and they start to grow and get larger, um, larger, uh, this is the drop diameter, growing drop diameter. So it turns out that about 800 nanometers is a good size of the salt of, of the water droplet to start off with, and then it will grow readily grow. Okay, um, so that's the the size of the that determines the size of the nozzle that you want. So there's an equation here where we can calculate the albedo a or the reflectivity as a function of the cloud depth in meters. So this is the thickness of the cloud in meters. This is the liquid water content in cubic centimeters of water per cubic meters of air, the L factor. N is the number of cloud drops per cubic centimeter. And you plug these factors into this equation and it gives you the albedo or the reflectivity. You can rewrite this and calculate what nuclei concentration n you need for a given albedo. So it's a function of the albedo and the cloud thickness and the water vapor, uh, the water content of the cloud. Now, if you have a jet here, so if you have a nozzle and you, and you get a pulse of water coming out, the water, there, there's really instability of these jets and then that generates a different droplets here. Okay, so this is the type of process. You've got all of these streams of water coming out through these little holes in a silicon wafer. And then because of the rally instability, they break into these droplets and you tailor the size of the uh, orifices of the filter 
to get the size of the droplets. I'll continue this video. Thanks for listening.